Hi everyone and welcome to this Valkyrie Sound tutorial. This is the second in a mini-series looking at adaptive audio powered by a data engine. In the last video we created the engine and in this video we're going to use it to power a motion tracker, just like the one in Alien Isolation. First we need our sounds. I spent some time in Cubase reproducing the motion tracker beep that you find in Alien Isolation. You can download that file using the link below. I've used this recording from Joe Deshawn on freesound.org for the static. I created slices of about one or two seconds long and then applied various distortion and grain effects to it. I also used this same sample to create a 10 second loop of unaltered static to act as the bass layer. So let's create our first motion tracker sound cue. I've called mine M Tracker Beep 1. And into this pull a beep. What I've then done is add a modulator and a delay node. We're going to create four sound cues for beeps and each one is going to have a progressively higher modulator range and a shorter delay range. For the first one, I've set the modulator to 1.18 and 1.2. One is fine for that, we don't really want to change the volume. A range between 1.18 and 1.2 is very narrow. If the pitch is going to bounce up and down all over the place, it could be harder for the player to link rising pitches with their proximity to danger. I think that when we change these values, we're changing a percentage of the pitch rather than any cent. So this value here is actually 118% of the original pitch, and this is 120% of the original pitch. Next, we'll set the delay node to 1.8 and 2.2. Once you've got that set up and connected to the output, you want to apply this to the other three beep sounds as well. So you can duplicate or press Ctrl and W to duplicate the beep. And in there, we're going to change the modulator and delay values. For beep 2, I put the pitch min to 1.23, max to 1.25, delay 0.8 and 1.4. For beep 3, pitch min 1.26, max 1.28, and the delay 0.4 and 0.6. And then for beep 4, pitch min 1.29, max 1.31, and the delay 0.1 and 0.2. Next, the static loop or bass layer, and when you add this into the queue, make sure you tick the looping box here. Nothing else that we need to do to that one. For the distortion sounds, I've created a three layered sound queue. Here we have four pieces of static feeding into a random node. And in the second layer, we have six more pieces of static, but those are a lot shorter than the first set. And they also feed into a random node. Both run into separate modulators, which have the same values. Here we're changing the pitch and we're changing the volume. And then they go into their own delays, which again share the same values. The third layer is initially just a copy of the beep sound cue with a random node added in. It has its own modulator, which again changes the volume as well as the pitch, and its own delay. I've added two blank inputs for the static layers. And for the beep, I've added four. I've also dropped the weight or the likelihood of the beep sound from playing from one to 0.5. That's because I want the beep to be very occasional. It's to make the player strain their ears for a second beep. And it also highlights the unreliability of the analog motion tracker. Just between the mixer and output nodes, we have another delay node. And that's really just to make sure we don't get an endless repeat of static. And there we are. Once you put your sounds together, the next step is to drag them all into the character blueprint. So, as a reminder, to do that, we just select the sound and we can drag and drop it into the component section up here on the upper left. Remember that for all of these, you want to be sure that the auto activate box is unticked. The fastest way to do that, upper right, UTO, auto activate, untick. Next, we need to create some new parameters. So remember last time we already made our motion tracker input parameter, that was a float. The next parameter we need is also a float, and I've called that min detectable speed. That's going to be how fast the NPC has to be moving before our motion tracker picks it up. I've just put the value there to 5, but of course use whatever you like. The next parameter is also a float, and I've called that queue duration. I'm going to leave that one blank, it's going to be set by the system itself. And finally, we're going to add a Boolean parameter, motion tracker active. So we can check whether or not the player has actually activated the motion tracker. And now onto the construction. First, we're going to check that there's an NPC within our radius, that it's moving above our minimum speed, 
and then we'll check whether the player has activated their motion tracker. Step one, check if the nearest NPC is moving and if the motion tracker is active. So first of all, we're going to create a custom event. I've called mine audio motion tracker. So to create a custom event, right click, make sure context sensitive is ticked, add custom event, call it what you want. And then once we've got that in, we're going to hook it up to a branch node. Make sure you leave plenty of space for this bit. We're going to get the closest line of sight parameter that we set before in our line of sight calcs section here. Just drag that out, get, and we're going to get velocity of that parameter. That then goes into a vector length node. We plug that into a greater than float, and the lower value is going to be our minimum detectable speed, the parameter we made earlier. We'll connect that to an AND node, and into the bottom of that input, we'll add the motion tracker active boolean. From the branch node's true output, add a sequence node, and from the top output of that, you want to add a do once node. Pull out from the reset execution pin, and we're going to add another custom event. I've called mine reset m tracker, and you'll see why in a moment. We'll come back to this section to hook everything up once we've done a couple of other things. So next, if you scroll down a little bit, we're going to do the right mouse button, which as you can see from my note across the top here, is going to toggle the motion tracker and set its active status. Once it's deactivated, it's going to check if there's any Q duration value above 0.1. If there is, we're going to apply a fade out, and then we'll stop that sound or sounds that are playing. That prevents any beeps from playing once the right mouse button has been released. So, we're going to right click, and I'll bring that up. From the pressed output, we're going to add a set motion tracker active, and we're going to tick that to true, and then from there, we're going to get the fade in node, and we're going to connect that to the M tracker base layer. That's our audio component up on the left hand side. So drag that in and then hook it up. And for this, we're going to change the fade in duration to 0.5. From the released output, we're going to get another. You can just copy this. Set motion tracker active and untick it so it's false. Then we're going to route that to a branch node with a condition of Q duration greater than 0.1. From the true output, we're going to add another fade out node and we'll connect it to all of the beep audio components and the M tracker base layer as well. And for this, the fade out duration is 0.1. Then we add a delay, which is going to be equal to that fade out duration. And that allows the fade out to happen. The fade out node itself isn't a timer node, so it won't wait before it moves on to its execution output. So if we want to make sure that we have that fade out, we need to add a delay in. And then after that, we're going to stop. And that's a stop node, which we can get by just pulling off from one of the audio components and then typing in stop. With that added, you want to hook up all of the beeps and the M tracker base layer as well. Go back to the branch node. From its false output, we're going to add another fade out node, again with the value of 0.1 and another delay of 0.1. And this one is just for the M tracker base layer. And then we add a stop node for the base layer as well. Once we fade it out and stopped our unwanted sounds, we're going to trigger our custom reset M tracker event. Both of the stops should be connected to that custom event. Next, we're going to move on to this tiny section down here, and this is the additional layered sounds. This is where the static and the distortion effects come into play. So from the second sequence output, we're going to run down, and we are going to add a do once node. Then we're going to add a play node, and this is from the M tracker distortion. So you can just drop that in, drag out, type in, oops, type in play, and hook that up to the completed output of the do once node. From that, we'll add a delay node, and again, leave it plenty of space. From the distortion audio component, we're going to get sound. That's this blue circle one down here. And from the sound output there, we want to get duration, and that's going to give us how long that individual cue is. We're going to plug that into the delay duration, and then from the delay output, from the completed, we're going to route that back to the reset of the do once node. One downside to this is that the duration is always equal to the longest wave in the sound queue. That means if we have five queues and one is 10 seconds long and the others are only a second long, it's going to pick 10 seconds as the duration for the whole queue. It's not a massive issue for this particular section, just this little bit here. We don't really mind if there's a little bit of a gap between our distortion effects, but it is an issue for the beeps. And that is why we've separated our beeps out into four separate sound cues, rather than making it one sound cue. 
So by creating four separate sound cues, we have better control over how quickly we can load in the next sound. Next, from the false output of our branch up here, we're going to pull out and add a delay node. And I put the delay there for 0.5. And then we add a fade out node to that one, again for the M tracker distortion. Put the fade out duration at 0.5 as well. And of course, we need a delay node in there to make sure that that fade out actually happens. And that needs to be equal to the fade out duration we set in the fade out node itself. Just compile that and save because it's dirty apparently. So what this does here is it ensures that if there are any distortion sounds playing after the motion tracker has been put away or deactivated, then we smoothly stop them from playing. Next up is the motion tracker itself, which as you can see is basically one line iterated a few times. From our do once node, the one that we created at the start, we're going to add a branch node and the condition input here is going to be motion tracker input less than 0.2. The true output, scroll along, we'll go to the reset M tracker, a custom event that we created earlier. And the false output will go to another branch. That branch node will have a condition of motion tracker greater than 0.2 and less than 0.4. The true output of that branch goes to a fade out node and then to a fade in node. Both durations should be set to 0.1 and in the fade in node we're going to plug in the audio component that this line is going to play. So if we zoom out, this is line 1, so it's going to play beep 1. Line 2 is going to play beep 2, line 3, beep 3, line 4, beep 4. What we want to do as well is fade out the other beeps. That basically helps us to avoid conflicting beeps. Drag off from the beep 1 node and we want to get sound again, that blue loop. And again from that we drag off and get duration. From the fade in node we're going to add our set cue duration. Just set. We're going to plug the duration of the sound into that. And we're also going to plug the duration into the duration input of the delay node. We're not going to take it from the set node. The reason for that is that because each line we create is going to have the ability to update the cue duration value, we don't want to inadvertently set the delay from a different line if the player has crossed a line since we've started running this section. From the delay node, we then add another reset M tracker, our custom event from before. And that's it. We do this four times overall. So for our motion tracker input values, remember the first one is 0.2. We have our greater than 0.2, less than 0.4, greater than 0.4, but less than 0.6, greater than 0.6, but less than 0.8, and greater than 0.8. And at each stage, remember, this is line 2, so we have beep 2. That means we have a fade out for 1, 3, and 4. This is beep 3, so we have a fade out for 1, 2, and 4. This is beep 4, so we have a fade out for 1, 2, and 3. The values for all of these, the fade outs and fades in, is 0.1. Everything else is the same as it was in the top line there. So you can see that this breaks down our motion tracker input value into five equal sections, with four of those lines, four of those sections resulting in a sound being played. The sound will get progressively higher in pitch and faster paced as we get closer to one. And that's it, there we are. A motion tracker very much like the one in Alien Isolation. Next, we're going to create a real-time strategy, RTS battle chatter system. So there's lots more that we can do with this data engine. That's it for now, thanks very much for watching. Take care and enjoy making your own projects.